sun sing, salvation's glad Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That portion of God's holy word we consider this morning, the Holy Ghost caused the evangelist Matthew to write for our comfort. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. There was a man named George. He was coming home from work one day in a terrible state. He had just been fired from his job for accusations of embezzling money. As he gets out of his car, his wife comes to meet him, not with the hug and kiss that makes married life so happy for a working man, but with a look of anger and shame on her face. I found out about the affair, George. How could you do this to me? You're worthless. They came and took everything we have. I'm taking the kids and leaving. Don't ever speak to me again. And she stalked off in a huff of insults and tears. Shocked by the end of the closest relationship he had ever had and by the loss of his children, George entered his house to find out that they really had taken everything. The IRS had audited him and had come and confiscated everything of value in his house for auction. And as he was standing in the living room, dazed by the disasters of his day, someone came through his open door, taped a white sheet of paper to his front window, and said to him, you have to vacate these premises immediately. Your house has been foreclosed. If you give me any trouble, I will be forced to call the authorities. Further stunned by the loss of really everything he had, George walked out to the sidewalk. He tried to look and see what he had lost, but it was too much for him. Everything good that he had ever had was gone. All his life's labor, gone. His family, gone. His job, gone. His own dignity and self-respect and reputa reputation, gone. His future and hope of ever retrieving what he had lost was gone. He was poor. He was poor because he had lost everything good in his life. As poor as a homeless man on a street. And that he was, homeless by the side of the road, without anything at all to love or to use for his pleasure. And he had no means to get back what he lost. And he might well be facing prison for his embezzlement. He was poorer than he thought he could ever be. And so he cried. He got down on his knees and he wept. Not just because he had lost everything. No, a deeper realization hit him that hurt him more. It was that it was all his fault. He had not been satisfied with what he had, but had tried to get more, and even the more that he got by his thieving, he spent it all on pleasure, so that he cheated on his taxes and lost his only means of making money. It was his fault. He had gambled with life and lost, and the woman that he had loved and who bore him his children had left him, and he deserved it. He had thought a little love on the side might be normal, Lots of people do it, but his pursuit of so-called normalcy destroyed his precious family and left him all alone. He had no friends at work, no friends at home, no friends anywhere, and it was all his fault. He did it to himself. What could he do but mourn? He mourned. 
He regretted who he was and what he had done. And at that moment, when he saw that he had lost everything and that it was all his fault, all the pride of life that he thought he had so much control over was brought down to the ground. He was humiliated. He was brought low. Every thought he had was just another mistake he made. And every thought afflicted his conscience and brought upon himself a feeling of utter contempt for himself. He despaired of who he was. He was the type of man he himself would hate. He was a thief, an adulterer, a lush, greedy, selfishly ambitious, and he found finally that he had no dignity in himself at all. He was thoroughly humbled. For the first time in his life, he stopped being the proud, self-assertive go-getter that he thought he was. And he became meek. And then George felt something in himself that was different than any desire he remembered having. It comes when someone realized that he has lost and what he has lost. As the song goes, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. He had torn down his paradise with his own hands and he wanted it back. Not the greed and the pride of life that had ruined everything he had, but his wife and his children and the respect that he had lost. He hungered for it. He thirsted to be a different person, to be a person who wouldn't squander everything he had. In all of this, he felt cursed and he deserved the curse. He deserved it all. He had never really understood what it meant to be cursed. He thought it was some random act of God to punish people who may or may not deserve it. But now he got it. He was cursed by his own fault. And so he sat sweating in the hot afternoon sun, pining away for what he could never give himself. Poor, mourning, meek, hungry, and thirsty for what he could never again have. Then behind him, he heard the mailman come and drop off his mail. Grateful for a distraction from his misery, George got up and got the mail. In the midst of threatening bills and notices, he found a single letter addressed to him. He opened it up with haste and found these words written to him. Dear George, I hope this letter finds you as you are, poor, sad, humbled, and longing for something good in the hellhole that you've made your life into. All your life you've taken what you want and done whatever you could to fulfill the desires of your eyes. But what you need now isn't something you can do a single thing to get. What you need now isn't something to plot and plan over and find some way for you to work your way up. What you need is forgiveness. I forgive you. I forgive you for rebelling against me and defying my authority when I only wanted what was best for you. I forgive you for taking your inheritance and squandering it on pleasures that are all now gone and have left you ruined and alone. I forgive you for every failing, every disrespectful word you spoke to me, everything you've done to break my heart. You don't even have to ask. I forgive you. It's all clean. I have sold everything I have and paid the IRS your debt. I have interceded with your boss and paid what you stole so that they will not press charges and throw you in prison. I am as of this afternoon that you will receive this letter, speaking with your wife right now to reconcile her to you. I pray that she will be reconciled. I do this because I forgive you and I love you. And there is nothing I want more for you than that you would know in the midst of all your suffering that you are blessed beyond compare. Don't despair. I have invested some money that you will have someday. For now you will live as the poor pauper you are, but know this, your debt is gone. Your crimes are forgotten. Come home. All things are ready for you here. Love, Dad. George is the sinner and the saint. You belong to the Holy Christian Church. There is a church on earth and there is the church in heaven and they are one and the same church. George belongs to the church on earth. The church is made up of all those who believed in Christ here on earth. Those who believe in Christ first come to acknowledge their sin. They must know that they are sinners if they are to be saints. Only when they know their sin will they desire to be freed from it. George had to know what he had lost before he could really desire what he needed. The first three Beatitudes teach us what comes before faith, 
And the fourth beatitude teaches us what faith is. The first beatitude is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Repentance is like coming home one day and finding that you have lost everything. But it isn't material things that you've lost. It's heavenly things. Heaven has been foreclosed on you. You are cast out of it. All the good things that you have done haven't done a bit of good. In fact, instead, your works have angered God and have alienated your neighbors from you. You are poor in spirit. This means your spirit has no help or aid to give to save you. You are by nature spiritually dead in your sins and trespasses, as the scripture says in Ephesians 2. You have nothing to offer to God or anyone that is spiritually good. You have, as St. Paul says in Romans 3, altogether become corrupt. You are poor in spirit. And Jesus promises to those who have recognized their sins that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. You see that you have lost everything, and Jesus in turn promises you everything that you have lost and more. And Jesus can do this. He has the authority to do this because he himself was rich in spirit but became poor for your sakes. He was rich spiritually. He did all things well, but he became poor for your sakes. He became poor spiritually. What does this mean? This means that he took your sins, your debts, and he claimed them as his own, and he paid them not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death. Why? That you may belong to him and live under him in his kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The next step of repentance, after realizing that you have lost every good spiritual thing, is to mourn because it's your fault. That's what happened to George. It isn't God's fault. It isn't your neighbor's fault. It isn't society or the media or your sorry lot in life. It's all your fault that you haven't loved God and haven't loved your neighbor. Mourning in the way that Jesus here describes it means recognizing the crimes that you have committed against God, owning up to who you are and what you have done. And Jesus promises to those who mourn over their sins that they will be comforted. This is the second beatitude and the second step of repentance. Those who mourn will be comforted. This is the comfort of nothing else than the good news, the gospel. Jesus himself earned this comfort. He mourned while he was here on earth, and not just when he wept for Lazarus, but when he hung naked on the cross and abandoned by everyone he loved. And even though it wasn't his fault, he claimed that it was his fault. You see, he is your substitute. He takes your place. He mourns over your sins because he really has made them his own. He has made his own every spiritual crime you have committed so that they are no longer yours because he has claimed them as his own. He has taken them from you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ's death for the sin of the world is the only comfort that poor sinners who mourn over their sins can possibly find. Nothing else will be enough. No food or drink or lover or drug or job or accomplishment can take away from those who mourn their awareness that it is all their fault. Only Jesus, who has power over our consciences, over sin and death, only he can take this feeling and reality of guilt away from us. His comfort is that your sins are forgiven in his blood, and your comfort may not always be felt here on earth completely, but it will be complete when you enter heaven with all the saints who have gone before you and without a memory of any single sin. It will all be permanently gone. The third beatitude and the third step of repentance that God works in you after leading you to recognize first your spiritual poverty and then to leading you to mourn over your sin, the third step is to be humbled. That is what it means to be meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Knowing your sin humbles you. It shows you that you aren't anything special. The law doesn't let you be anything special in God's sight. 
as the scripture says, that no flesh may boast in his sight. The scripture has confined all under sin. Instead, the poor in spirit and those who mourn are brought down by the awareness that they are sinners before God. They are humbled. And this awareness of their sin afflicts them. Another word for the meek in the Old Testament is the afflicted. You feel your failings and it humbles you. And God promises the meek that they shall inherit the earth. Now this just seems quite ridiculous because the meek don't get anything on earth. But it means two things. First, everything is yours to enjoy now, here. Everything that your sin has tainted, Jesus has made clean for you. So you can enjoy your family. You can enjoy your job. You can enjoy the works of love that God has given us to do with a clear conscience, which is something that nobody else can do, however rich he is. Everything that your sin has tainted, Jesus has made clean for you. You may not have a lot, but everything you have is from God, and he gives it to you to enjoy. And just as you don't always feel the kingdom of heaven now or always feel comforted, so your inheritance of the earth is not yet fully realized, but you will inherit the earth. You are poor now and in a lowly position on earth, and that's the way it is with God's people on earth, with his saints on earth. But soon, God will make new heavens and a new earth, and it will be yours, all pure and holy, so that just as the tax collector was humbled and meek, and then exalted, and left the temple justified, so you will be exalted after this short life to inherit greater things than you can imagine. As the scripture says, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now after these three steps of repentance, we come to what completes repentance, which is faith itself. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness completes repentance. It is faith in the gospel. That is the hunger and thirst. The righteousness is the gospel. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This hunger isn't our desire to do better, although the repentant do desire to do better. The poor in spirit and the meek who mourn know that nothing they could do and no intent of their heart could be a righteousness good enough for God. Instead, the hungry and thirsty long for Christ's righteousness, which is perfect and reconciles God to them and makes them their maker, their friend, and their father when he was their enemy. And so Jesus gives to those who hunger and thirst this righteousness. He says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is what is called justification. Justification. Jesus makes sinners just, righteous. He makes the guilty innocent. He makes George somebody that he knows he's not. He makes a sinner into a righteous person, not by the sinner doing a single thing, but by reckoning to him, imputing to him, counting to him the perfect obedience of what Christ has done. The righteousness with which God fills us in our need is that spotless obedience of his son, Jesus Christ. It is the obedience to God's will that drove him to death on the cross to pay for sinners' sins who did not deserve such a sacrifice. And there he offered up his innocence that made full satisfaction for our guilt so that God now holds nothing against you because Jesus has satisfied the wrath of God. He has reconciled God to us. He has turned his anger away from us and turned his face back to shine on you today and call a sinner a saint. And this knowledge satisfies us in our deepest need on earth. In the face of death, in the face of the loss of loved ones, in the face of the loss of everything that we have that we have found good in our lives. This comforts us. Nothing else that anybody could give us, nothing else that anybody could do could satisfy our hunger and thirst for righteousness. Only Jesus can and he does. And he will one day satisfy us completely, as David says in Psalm 17. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness.
It is so with the church of God. She is satisfied only by Jesus, her Lord. She is a holy and she is a holy communion of saints because she believes in the forgiveness of sins, which is her righteousness before God. This is the hope of every sinner who has ever lived, whether it was a small, small flame of faith or a glowing fire. This hunger and thirst for righteousness was satisfied, and it was satisfied by Jesus. And that means that every sinner who believes in Jesus overcomes death and becomes a saint. So brothers and sisters, embrace these two titles that the Beatitudes teach you, sinner and saint. Sinner, because it reminds you of your great need for forgiveness, of your need for holiness. And only sinners will be blessed by Jesus. Saint, because the blessedness of which Jesus speaks is to make you holy. That's what saint means, holy. It is to give you a kingdom that is heavenly, that is above all the evil that you see in yourself and in the world. It is to forgive you all your sins and join you in holy communion with all the saints in heaven and on earth. And that is what it means to be blessed, to be saved from the curse that we see around us. God grant us such faith in the face of trials and persecutions that faith's fruits of mercy, purity, and peace may abound among us always. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God,